You're listening to the Higher Ideas Podcast, where ideas grow. Connect on Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, or higherideas.net. Now here's your host, I. Hello, fellow human, and welcome back to the Higher Ideas Podcast. Today's episode is all about healing, another big subject that I could spend many episodes discussing. But today, let's look into some really core mechanics and dynamics of this process called healing. Now, while at first glance, this might not seem intriguing to everyone listening right now, in my opinion, this should be of interest to everyone. Because we've all been sick at one point or another in our lives, we've all needed and taken advantage of healing. Some of us have had a rougher go than others. Some of us have had cancer and amputations, car accidents, and all kinds of crazy traumatic stuff. And some others have had, you know, pretty rough flus that they've had to get over for a week. But one way or another, whether it's a scraped knee or a broken knee, we've all needed healing. I can guarantee that. I would put money on that. And that's because it's a fact of life. Illness, disease, injury comes to all of us in one form or another, at one point or another, and we can all be certain that in our futures, we're all going to encounter it again and again, as long as we're alive. So everything you can learn about it comes in handy, sooner or later. And this is what I'm offering today, some really foundational, important ideas about healing that have been of huge use to me in my own life and have helped me heal myself so much. So I'm glad you're here to receive it. So let's begin with a question. And I'll give you some time to think about it. I really want you to think about this and try to find an answer in your own minds. And the question is, when can you call an injury healed? And this can be from something as small as a stubbed toe to as big as cancer. When can you call an injury healed? When can you call an injury healed? When can you call injury? Healed. Okay, so, what kind of answer did you come up with? Well, you don't have to tell me because I'm going to use my magical, psychical powers right now and guess that your answer most likely was something that boils down to when the flesh is restored, right? If you break a bone, that injury is healed when the bone is solid again. If you cut your skin, that injury is healed when there's no longer a cut there, no longer a scab there, maybe a scar, but by and large, the cut is sealed and it's skin again. If you stub your toe, it's healed when it stops throbbing, right? An injury is healed when the flesh is restored. Well, actually, 
Not so fast. That is not a whole answer. That's part of the answer. But the real answer to when can you call an injury healed is actually when you're done talking about it. Is that ringing a bell for anybody? Is that giving anyone an aha moment? I sure hope so. Well, let's keep going. In other words, the answer is when it's out of mind. When you think about it, if you stub your toe and, you know, it hurts for maybe 10 minutes and then it stops hurting, that was the extent of the injury, you walk away and you never think about it again. You don't talk about it for the next week. Maybe you do, actually. Maybe it hurt that bad. But if it didn't, if it, if it was just one of those annoying, ah, shit kind of moments that you walk away from and forget about, that's when the injury is healed, when you're done thinking about it. But let's say you hit your toe, and for some reason, for the next year, you're telling people about this time you hit your toe so bad, and it was such a horrible experience, and maybe it bled, maybe you fainted, maybe you had to get stitches, maybe the stitches got infected, maybe it was such an ordeal that for some reason you can't stop telling people about this story, or thinking about it, or basing your life around it for a year or whatever, right? Then a simple stubbed toe suddenly has become such a huge injury. And it took all of that time to heal, and it's not done healing until you're done thinking about it. In other words, the sort of echo an injury creates in your mind is also a part of that injury. And until that echo stops reverberating, the injury is still there. Now look, this is obviously also the case with really traumatic health battles, such as someone who's been in a car accident, someone who's battled cancer, or someone who's been stabbed or something, who's been attacked. Obviously, the flesh sealing up is not the end of that injury for that person. They're going to have to deal with this for a long time. And as long as they think about it, as long as they talk about it to people they know, that injury is not healed. So in other words, healing and injury are 50% mental. Seems obvious, right? I mean, now that I've spelled it out, of course, of course it is, right? But how many of you guys got the answer before I pointed it out? Now, I'm not saying that to make you feel bad, because it's not your fault. We forget in our societies, in our Western society at least, we forget the mental aspects of health and healing because our society largely ignores that whole half of the equation. The mental, spiritual, psychological, whatever you want to call it, that whole side is largely swept under the rug. And that's mostly because science doesn't understand a lot of it. Science doesn't understand the mind, the spirit, existence, consciousness, you know, these are mysteries. So because we live in these science-based societies, this whole other half of the equation, instead of being remembered and addressed and explored, is kind of shuffled away. It's like, ah, that's not important. You could just deal with it. It'll throw you some pills. It'll make you feel good. Forget about it. We treated your body. You're fine. Head out the door. You'll survive. Right? That's the attitude. And all you have to do is ask anybody you know that's gone through some kind of serious health battle in their lives, and they'll tell you the same thing. They'll agree. Healing the body is only half the battle. The other half is healing the self, the being, the spirit. And look, if you've heard episode 19 of this podcast, you'll know that I too have gone through a very serious health episode in my life, and it left me really scarred for many years. This was a huge many, many years long health battle that pretty much drove me to the edge of suicide from just miserable, relentless pain that had no solution. Um, so when I walked out of that situation, I walked out with post-traumatic stress, with anxiety attacks for the first time in my life, with a lingering sort of hypochondria that took years to sort of wrangle back into something reasonable. I had a ruined life for many years after that many-year-long health battle. So even though the surgery had happened and the healing from the surgery had taken only a month or so, it took years to finally heal that injury. 
so I can vouch for it too. I'm definitely speaking from experience here. Healing the body is only half the battle. The other half is mental, spiritual, internal. And once you really digest and grasp this concept of the mind or the soul, the spirit, being just as much a body as the physical body, you come to see the human being in its whole state. 50% body, 50% being. If you watched episode 31 of this podcast, you'll know this already. The human being is a being and a body. So of course, anything that injures the body will have repercussions on the being. But this brings up the question, do injuries on the being affect the body? Can mental problems manifest as disease? We're getting into the deep dynamic of mind and body, and this is where stuff gets really interesting. So where does disease start? Does it always start from a physical force? Is it always because of an impact or radiation or a virus, bacteria, toxins of some sort? Is that always where illness comes from? Can the mind create physical illness? Well, understanding that these two halves are so intricately woven together, it should be pretty clear that, of course, the mind can create physical illness. It might not seem so obvious at first glance, but look, when you move your body, that's mind over matter, right? Any conscious action you take with your body is your mind affecting your body, so of course it's reasonable to assume that somehow or another, Problems in your mind can create problems in the body. And the most basic example of that is muscle tension, which develops into knots, muscle knots, which can really screw up the mechanics of your body to the point where it can even start injuring bones, grinding joints together and whatnot. I think that's one of the most common and frequent health problems people get in our society. Joint problems, muscle problems, skeletal problems, right? Now, of course, these can be caused by physical strain, such as working out too hard. They can also be caused by sitting in really bad positions for a really long time, as we tend to do in our computer society. So yes, these are physical causes for muscular problems. But what about stress? What about just pure body tension? So here we have a situation where a purely mental effect, stress, which is just a mind sort of obsessing on something that bothers it, right? And minds being either worried or anxious or fearful or angry all the time, holding on to tension, which manifests as tension in the muscles. And there isn't a disease there. There isn't bacteria there. There isn't some kind of mechanical impact that caused those muscles to become that way. It's entirely because of you. It's entirely because of the mind inside that body being so tense that it doesn't even realize that tension is manifesting in their body. It's like a subconscious clenching of the flesh that, when held over time, starts to create these real serious problems that can really become destructive. And that's at the more benign end of the scale, because there are other issues, serious health issues, that begin in the mind. For example, substance addiction. When somebody gets addicted to a destructive drug, a drug that harms the body, of course, eventually they end up with some really serious health problems. Look at those photos of people slowly falling apart because of meth over several mugshots of uh, living with this stuff. Look at alcohol and what it can do to various organs of the body, right? Look at tobacco and what that does to the body. These are all substances that, yes, have caused illness in the body. But why did a person approach that substance to begin with? Why did a person become addicted to those substances? Why would a person stick a needle in their arm for the first time to shoot up with stuff that makes them feel good? Well, because there's some kind of mental issue there. There's either a past trauma that they can't get over and they're hiding from, or there's something in their lives or their minds that they don't want to face, and they turn to overwhelming escapism by, by smothering themselves by this or that substance. And of course, it can also be just some need for self-destruction or self-hate, some kind of self-punishing 
reason for approaching this stuff. I mean, there's all kinds of complexes you can come up with. But one way or another, it boils down to a mind making decisions that drive that body towards destructive forces. You can ask anybody that works at an addiction recovery center, and they'll tell you, absolutely, all of these addictions begin with some kind of mental injury that needs healing. And as long as you don't heal that, you're not going to be healing the addiction. So here again, we have an example of physical illness that comes about purely from an initially mental illness. And of course, you can keep expanding that to include other things like obesity. There is a real physical illness that starts in the mind. Because again, it's a sort of addiction to pleasure, to delicious food. Very similarly to a drug addiction, it falls into the same complexes. Self-destruction, self-loathing, a feeling of needing to cover up bad feelings with pleasure to distract oneself from negativity by overwhelming the senses with pleasure. Um, look, are you starting to see, are you starting to understand that illness can start in the mind? Absolutely. And where viruses and radiation and heavy impacts are the problems that can happen to a physical body, the equivalent forces when it comes to mental injury are things like fear, stress, hate, and any traumatic, shocking, sudden experience a person can go through is equivalent to a heavy impact. Let's look at scars, for example. Now, when you hurt your skin pretty badly, it'll heal, it'll scab, but very often it'll scar. Well, scar tissue is harder skin, right? And in a weird way, it's like a defense mechanism. Your body is thinking, well, I keep getting injured here, or I got injured pretty badly here. Maybe I need to heal thicker here. Maybe I need to heal harder. So that next time an impact comes along, Maybe it won't tear, right? It's a sort of adaptation. But if that's a safer way to be, why isn't all of our skin like scar tissue all the time? Well, it's because there's a trade-off. When you have scar tissue, you lose sensitivity. When you have scar tissue, you lose flexibility. And when it comes to the mind, there is exactly the same system at work. A scar on the soul is fear. Think about it. You receive some kind of trauma in your life, and oftentimes, what are you left with? A lingering fear. Fear is like scar tissue that grows on the mind or the spirits in order to try and anticipate the next time. But just like scar tissue brings a lack of sensitivity, a lack of mobility, a lack of flexibility, so will fear. So while a small scar or a small fear may not encumber you in any way and be sort of forgettable, if you just keep gathering these scars, eventually you become rigid, immovable, absolutely tight. And all too often, that's the way people walk around in life. Absolutely rigid with fear. But the good news is, while a physical body has a really hard time recovering from a scar, the mental body absolutely can heal completely from a scar. But it takes work. It takes manual work from you. And of the forces that can injure a mind, I definitely think fear is one of the most dangerous. It's one of the most powerful. It's one of the most difficult to heal. And of course, there's also stress or strain, which can come from many different angles. It can come from anger, it can come from worry, it can come from overloading the system. Uh, But one way or another, stress and fear, I think, are the major culprits in mental injury. And here's where every one of us needs to start worrying about this stuff, because the fact is, in our society, it can't be denied that we are soaking in stress and fear all the time from every angle. Turn on the news for a second and you'll just see fear coming at you. And as we keep cranking up the demands on everyday life and trying to squeeze more and more activity into our day-to-day lives, stress is always on the rise. We can't deny that. We're soaking in stress and fear. But stress and fear are silent killers. So are you interested yet in some healing? 
This is why everyone should be aware of this other half of the body. And here's another reason. When you think about it, the body heals itself, right? When you cut yourself, you don't have to sit there and stare at the cut and tell the body to heal. You don't have to focus on your cells and really, really try hard. Come on, cells, reproduce, stick together, heal, throw out the bad, bring in the new, right? You don't have to do that. Your body is an automatic system. It's amazing that way. Most of the time, it takes care of itself. Your heart beats without you even trying. Your lungs keep breathing when you're not even paying attention. When you're sleeping, your skin and your muscles and your bones will heal, whether you ask them to or not. All you have to do is nurture it and steer it in helpful directions, right? Steer it out of danger, steer it towards safety. Don't ask too much of it, give it some good rest, feed it some good food, give it good materials, and it's going to do its thing. That's the physical half of the equation, and you don't have to worry about it, because the truth is, it's not you. It's your body. It's a piece of nature that takes care of itself. Now, when it comes to you, your soul, your mind, your spirit, that's your department. When there's an injury there, that's your work, and nobody else's. So turning your back on that reality only lets injuries pile up. And all of us, I'm sorry to say, fellow human, all of us are walking around with so many soul injuries that need fixing, that need healing. I see it in everyone, and of course it's in myself, and I'm always working on it. And when you start digging into this stuff, you start to realize just how much there is to do. But it's worth doing, because every internal injury you heal reflects in greater health in your life, and just a better state of being. When you have an injury on your body, your body's miserable, right? Well, it's the same way when you've got injuries in your mind. Your mind doesn't function quite as well. It's, it's always draining energy on this or that injury going on in there. So it's really worth going in and dealing with these things and clearing them away. Because the less of them you have, the closer you are to peace. So hopefully by now, fellow human, I've got you interested. I've got your attention. How do we heal the mind? How do we even start? Well, lucky for you, you've got your friend I here to help out. I certainly don't know all the answers, but having been through a lot of this journey myself, I can definitely share some tips. So let's begin with a little word play. Disease. Disease, disease, disease. Write it down. Look at it. Ponder it. Disease. Would it surprise you to know that we're actually mispronouncing that word? Because disease is actually dis ease. It's dis-ease, a lack of ease, right? Doesn't that perfectly describe what disease is? It's a dis-ease that comes upon a body. Everything was easy, everything was working fine, and then some kind of injury or external uh, interruption force like a virus and bacteria comes in, some kind of disbalance comes in, and creates suddenly a lack of ease. Things have become difficult. This body doesn't work easy anymore. I have dis-ease. And that means the opposite of disease isn't exactly health, as we tend to associate. It's actually ease. The opposite of disease, dis-ease, is ease. And when you realize that, it really reframes the whole process of healing. When you're fighting a disease, you're really trying to return to a state of ease. You're trying to eliminate whatever is causing the dis in the situation, whatever is obstructing, to return to ease. That's your goal. And when it comes to dis-ease in your mind, it all comes down to a mental holding. And by that I mean, it's a choice. Every mental complex, every anger you're holding on to, every resentment, every fear, every complex really, honestly, comes down to you holding it. And that's the dis-ease going on in your mind. It's not an injury that has come through and caused some kind of break in the mechanics of your mind. What's breaking in your mind is that you're holding something. 
and that's clogging up the works. Exactly what can be at work inside of any human mind that's creating these blockages and issues is about as individual as individual life experiences. It's as individual as individuality. So fellow human, while I can't offer you that personalized solution, what I can do is describe the system in which this problem is occurring. A way of understanding what's going on in your mind that will hopefully help you go in there to clear out these knots that really, in the end, come down to you. Only you can do it. And the reason only you can do it is you are your mind. You are you, right? Your consciousness, your, your series of experience, your, your acquired memories, your thoughts and ideas, these comprise what we call me or you. So by definition, all of it is within your control. It is your domain. You, your mind, your consciousness, is your domain. You rule there. You have to know this. And there's nothing going on in there that you don't have authority over. Because there aren't even any physical laws in your mind. It's a purely imaginary place. It's only limited by what you allow yourself to believe. So one very dangerous thing to believe that leads to unresolvable illness is I can't fix it. I'm not in charge. That part of my mind's body is irreparably harmed. That's not true. So that's why I said earlier, mental scars can completely heal. Because it's not bound by rules of flesh. It's not bound by rules of physical history. It can just change like that if you really chose for it to. So a mind that is completely scarred could have a revolutionary moment of deciding, no, I am healed. I don't need any of these scars. I can move beyond them. They can all heal. I believe that can happen. But of course, that's a huge feat to just get over it, to just get on top of it all of a sudden. That would be a very powerful mind at work. For most of us, including myself, we need some kind of story before we accept such a radical shift. We're not used to just having things change in a moment from one extreme to the other. We need some kind of trail. We need some kind of story before we accept what has happened. Your ego is what is keeping you from instantly healing. This need for a story, this need for some kind of logical process that happened to earn the result. And when it comes to healing mental uh, trauma, mental issues, that story that we need to go through is the entire processing of the experience, the coming to terms with it, and eventually the letting it go. So that's the kind of process healing a mental injury uh, invokes. And that also means that this entire process is a process of dragging the ego from a state of I'm injured to a state of I'm healed. So you'll be fighting your ego every step of the way, and it is the reason, it is the one and only reason you may get stuck at any point along the way. That's why it's so important to understand ego. I talk about ego a lot on the podcast. Please go ahead and soak up all you can if you're going to go on this internal healing journey, because it will be your enemy. It will be your undoing if you fall for it. So this metaphor I used of a story describing the process of healing really comes down to a logical series that leads from one point to another, right? That's a story, a beginning to an end, and all of the logical connection in between. Usually in a story, there's no point where everything just shifts, you're following a wizard through the woods, and all of a sudden, uh, from one second to the other, you're an android fighting space aliens. That doesn't happen, right? That's a completely different story. It doesn't flow, it doesn't connect. So a coherent story is going from point A to point Z through every letter of the alphabet. In other words, it's an equation. An equation is also a story in that every piece of it along the way is a part of the result at the end. So instead of calling this a story, let's call this an equation. And that's actually a perfect match for what's going on in your mind. Your mind is taking in experience in every moment of existence, right? Experience comes in, and then what happens? It gets calculated. It gets processed. 
some kind of understanding is distilled at the end by going through all sorts of what does this mean? How do I feel about this? How does this connect to what I know? What does this mean in terms of reality? You know, all of the time, every single experience as simple as smelling a flower to, to a horrible traumatic experience is something that goes into this system and is processed to resolution, just like an equation. And these things that create knots inside of us that become complexes and, and mental injuries are things that go in and don't solve. We call it resolving an issue, right? Really, we're solving an issue, like an equation. And if for some reason we can't reach a solution, it doesn't go out. It stays stuck, alive, with attention. See, you want to solve it. Your mind wants to solve it. That seems to be its most basic instinct. Understand, resolve, solve. So if something comes in and isn't getting that full treatment, if anything, it ends up commanding more resources because your mind doesn't understand this piece. Bring in more energy. Bring in more attention. Let's crack this nut, right? Now, why might one of these experiences come in and for some reason not digest properly, not come out the other end, not come up with a solution? Well, I could think of a few reasons, and they all come down to ego. Number one, you're not trying to solve it. You don't want to look at it. Something comes in, some experience comes in that's either too traumatic or too frustrating or too sad or too painful, and we don't want to face it. We don't even want to touch it. We want to be nowhere near it. For whatever reason, this particular situation is untouchable. Well, what happens? It doesn't just disappear. The experience came in. The equation is in the computer. So what's the computer going to do? It's going to store it in memory. It's going to put it somewhere. Um, with a flag on it that says, still have to deal with this, still have to figure this one out. And as long as that curiosity is there, as long as that knowledge it's not figured out is there, it might become, yes, less uh, less active in your life, it might become less um, um, demanding on, on active thought, but it'll still draw some resource, some curiosity, some part of you will always be pulling that way, saying, ah, oh, we didn't solve that, that's some kind of drain on attention resource. So this is when something becomes a repressed issue, in other words, a quiet injury, an injury that can almost be forgotten, but always is there. Now another reason things might get stuck is you're ignoring the solution. This is very similar to the first example, where instead of ignoring the entire issue, maybe you've looked at the whole issue and you do understand what's going on and the problems with it and the nuances and what needs to be addressed, but the solution is now untouchable. It's either something so uncomfortable to do, something you really don't want to shift or change, some stubbornness you're holding on to, or the solution is scary. The solution is difficult to face or enact or approach. And even though you've gone through all the work, you're not ready to step into that final state of healing by, by, by moving into the solution. You're staying way away from it. And so it stays again in memory. The third way an equation can come in and end up unresolved and stay stuck is by getting some part of the equation wrong. Some variable, some piece of the puzzle that you've decided to accept is actually false. It's not a true equation. So the answer that comes out the other side is not quite the solution. In other words, is not quite the cure to what's wrong. And it won't land you at completely healed. It might land you somewhere that's closer to healed, but not quite yet. If there's something really wrong in the equation, you might end up worse off for the, the, the resolution you accept. So how could this happen? How could parts of the equation be wrong? Well, it's because we don't know everything, of course. There's always room for error. But also, most of the time, it'll again be ego. It'll be preference. There are parts of every equation you sort of have to guess at. You sort of have to make a choice between maybe two choices, two polar opposite choices, or uh, maybe a whole list of nuanced options. But somewhere you'll have to make a choice of, all right, let's go with this. Let's go with this possibility. For example, when a child's parents get divorced, we all know that it's very common for the child to turn it into a complex of, I'm not worthy, this was my fault, right? Right? At that point in the equation, that child had a leaning towards self-doubt and chose that option. 
Now, the flip side is true if you've got a person that refuses or doesn't like the feeling of admitting defeat, doesn't like the feeling of admitting they're wrong, um, they'll tend to choose it's someone else's fault, where sometimes it may be their fault or it may be no one's fault. So do you see how it works? At any point along the equation, when you have uncertainty, you have a choice. And the same resistance that might have kept a person from approaching an equation, that might have kept a person from approaching a solution, in this case, might cause a person to avoid the proper variable in these uncertain areas. And when that solution doesn't lead to healing, doesn't lead to moving beyond the issue, and somehow it's still nagging at you, there's still something that feels not right about the situation, and it's not really put to bed, well, it's because you have to revisit the equation, try flipping things around, and see if you can get to a more healing solution, a more true solution to this particular life equation. So that, I think, covers most of the ways these equations can come in and get stuck somewhere in the mind. Okay, so we've gotten through uh, the first major analogy for understanding the system of the mind, and I hope it's already starting to get your gears turning, already starting to get you curious about your own issues and how they might compare to this model. And I definitely encourage you to do that. The whole process of unclogging a clogged equation is a process of getting in there and moving things around and participating and trying different points of view, trying different approaches until finally the solution is arrived at and everything unclogs. So before you go diving into yourself looking for any knots or kinks or unresolved equations in your, in your life, in your mind, there are a couple more truths I can arm you with. Now, I sort of already shared one of them, which is this all comes down to ego. So one of the most useful things you can do before you even get started is to sit down and figure out your fears, your core foundational fears, because that's what your ego is going to throw at you at many steps of the way. And keeping an eye out for these traps all starts with knowing yourself, all starts with with consciously being aware of what your, your fears and preferences are in the way you view the world. So sitting down and making a list of fears, whether you write it down or just give it some thought, shouldn't take much time. We know what our fears are. Our fears are never forgotten for any of us. They're the most constant companion in life, if anything. Now, once you have a list of your fears, it's also important to look at them critically and see if they boil down to a more foundational fear. So, for example, where someone might have a fear of abandonment and kind of stop there thinking, that's my fear, my fear is a fear of abandonment. That is true, but is there not a root that's deeper than that? What's a fear of abandonment? What happens when you're abandoned? You feel unwanted, you feel unworthy. So what's underneath a fear of abandonment is a fear, a doubt in your self-worth right? That's a deeper root. So just keep asking yourself why. Why am I afraid of this? Why am I afraid of that? Until you boil it down. And once you have that root deep understanding of your own fears, you will be armed against your ego's tricks. Because now as you re-examine these complexes that have been stuck in your life, you will purposely investigate them um, from the perspective of what you're afraid of. Is my fear reflecting in the way I'm processing this? Is my fear showing either in the way I avoid it, or the way I avoid the solution, or the way I avoid part of the equation? They should light up for you once you understand your fears, and then that's when you go in and tweak things. But there's another thing to watch out for that'll stop healing dead in its tracks. And that's accepting in any way, shape, or form that someone external to you needs to do anything before you can heal. And what I mean by that is so often as we question how did this go wrong and how do I get over this and what needs to happen before I can let it go, we'll fall for the trap of thinking, I can't let this go until this person apologizes, for example. Or I can't let this go until I understand why this person did that. I can't let this go until this person um, admits they were wrong. I can't let this go until this person gives me the validation I'm after. I can't let this go 
until that person um, pays for what happens. For example, these are all examples where you put the key to your healing outside of yourself in another person. And that's a huge mistake. That's entirely wrong. Because the second you accept any of those things, you're also by definition believing that your healing is outside of your own control. It's right there in the sentence I just repeated a bunch of times. I can't heal until this person does this. I can't heal until this person does that. What's at the beginning of all those sentences? I can't heal. Like a mantra. I can't heal. I can't heal. What did you do right there? You just told yourself you can't heal. No, you can't accept that at any point. You can't make your healing wait on anyone else because that's a trap. That's a trick to stop the healing. That's your ego. And once you've accepted this lie, I can't heal until external person dot dot dot, you're also going to have to set off on a journey to rescue this, this key to your healing that you've imagined in someone else. You're going to have to go and extract this from that person. Good luck. Good luck, because odds are you had a negative experience with this person. And you're going to have to approach this person now, initiate a conversation, right? A confrontation has to happen. That riles both people up immediately. Maybe the other person was already over the situation, and you're dragging it back into their life for this imaginary key you've placed inside of them. So you'll go and confront this person, and in this confrontation, you will immediately be manipulating because you entered it with a very specific goal in mind. You're here to extract um, an apology or a confession or validation. In other words, you'll be puppeteering this person, trying to make them do what you think they need to do before you can heal. And it's all a lie. And the person is highly likely not to cooperate because they may feel you're trying to extract something from them. They may want nothing to do with you. And then you'll both walk away angry and frustrated, maybe with a whole new level of mental injury to heal. So don't do it. Don't fall for the idea ever that your healing resides in the hands of someone else. It is entirely yours to heal. And you don't need to wait on anyone except yourself. Now, this thing I'm trying to warn you about can take many forms. It's really sneaky. For example, in the case of someone who has abandonment issues or something, who's looking for others to fulfill them. So say someone's father left them when they were young, and they stayed stuck with a self-worth issue, a self-worth fear. And because that wasn't resolved properly, it leads to a complex of looking for male figures in their life to fill this hole the father left, right? So the, the narrative inside this person would be something like, there's a hole in me, I need a man to come and fill it. But that's going to make you go forward in life looking to every male to fill this hole that some other figure left inside of you. It makes you vampiric. It's going to make you a carnivore, trying to extract, again, your healing out of a person in the form of approval. And if someone doesn't give it to you or doesn't live up to what you're expecting, you may overreact on them, um, pinning all of this angst and anger and frustration and abandonment feeling on this other male that has nothing to do with the original cause, right? These are the ways accepting that your healing is in the hands of someone else can lead us far astray. And in that example I just gave, where someone has a hole in their heart and themselves that they're trying to fill with the approval of another person. The real cure to that particular scar, that particular complex, is realizing that the presence of the whole is the problem. The whole is a fear. To remove the whole, not to fill it, to release the whole, to abandon the idea that there is a whole there is the cure. And that comes in the form of realizing, I don't need anybody for approval. I accept myself. I've always been fine just the way I am. It's turning away from the fear of your shortcomings and embracing the truth of your great qualities. The hole is gone without being filled because there wasn't really a hole there. See how we fall into these ideas, how we fall into these tricks of the minds that convince us uh, trap us in a state of ill health when in fact there was nothing there. It was all a nightmare. It was all a dream.
But of course it takes creative thinking. It takes thinking outside of your storyline. So all along the way, it's important to remember, ego is what will get in your way, every step of the way. Now, in case this whole mathematical, computational, uh, equational view of the mental process isn't clicking with somebody out there, there's actually another metaphor that also perfectly describes what's going on uh, when the mind gets stuck on these issues. Your digestive system, which is a combination of mouth, stomach, and intestines, right? A three-step process every time you eat food. And the reason this applies so perfectly to the mind is that the mind is actually a system for digesting reality. It works remarkably like a physical digestive system with these three stages. The mouth, which is the sensory system, which gives you all of the information you need to know about what's going in your body, right? Is it tasty? Is it disgusting? Is it cold? Is it hot? Is it smooth? Is it hard? Is it small? Is it big? Is it spiky? Is it rough? Is it soft? Is it chewy? Right? There's so much information that happens in the mouth before you even swallow a thing. And as you're chewing, you make the decision. Is this tasty? Do I want to swallow this? Or do I want to spit it out? Now the next step is swallowing. That's a decision you make. And that's an important choke point. Because that's not going to proceed unless you decide to swallow. So you swallow the food goes down to stage two, which is your stomach. And in your stomach, you have the breakdown. Things are separated into their constituent parts. And once that's done, it moves into the intestinal tract, which is all about absorbing nutrients and excreting the junk. And then poop comes out, and it's gone. You kept the good, you release the bad. Process over. Now let's look at the way the mind digests input, which is sensory input, which is informational input, which is experience, basically. Your mind eats experience and digests it. Now this is no problem when it comes to pleasant experience. Oh, this is tasty. This feels great, right? Stage one is no problem. Stage one is a joy. I love to smell this pretty flower. I love how it makes me feel. It's delicious, right? You swallow because you love this. You take it in. It goes into stage two, which is breakdown. Now, when it comes to pleasurable things, it's really easy. This feels good. I like it. Good stuff. Moves on to stage three. Absorb what you can out of it. Learn what you can out of it. Keep the beautiful memories. And then just forget about it. All too often, uh, what's good in life is so forgettable because it doesn't get stuck anywhere. It processes through very easily. But now let's put in a negative experience. Let's put in a frustration. Let's put in a trauma. So the second it hits the mouth of the mind, the entrance, it's already a problem. It's disgusting. It stinks. It tastes horrible. The texture is terrible. What is this? Ugh, I don't want this. This is bad. But here's the problem. Unlike the body, the mind can't spit it out. The only way to regurgitate for a mind is to forget. And I mean truly forget. I mean amnesia. Because the uh, watered-down version of this is repression. In which case, you're not actually spitting out the memory or the experience. You're just hiding it. It's still in your mental body. So you got to know that this is a drawback of experience, of memory, of the mind. Is once it goes in, once you've experienced it, once it's in the mouth, the only way out is out the butt, out the other end. And that's why earlier I told you You're going to need to face this stuff. You're going to need to decide that you're healing because you'll have to move through some hard stuff. In other words, you're going to have to swallow some really bitter pills. That's the only way to get it out at the other end is to go through it, or in this case, in this analogy, to let it through you. So back to the analogy, you've got something disgusting in your mouth and you don't want to swallow the, the choke point between mouth and stomach is the choice to swallow. A lot of people get stuck right here and keep a, an uncomfortable experience in their mouth forever. They never swallow it. And this becomes a problem because it's not getting processed at all. It's obstructing the entranceway. It's, it's tainting everything that comes in. Now, even if you eat something delicious, a little juice from that disgusting stuff still in your mouth gets into the delicious experience. And even delicious, wonderful experiences in life become tainted 
with a trace of this thing you're refusing to swallow. You're keeping it in your cheeks. And as you add more and more of this stuff, you could just imagine what kind of traffic blockage you're causing, what kind of always bitter taste in your mouth you're retaining. You can't spit it out. You have to swallow it. You have to swallow. So, how do we swallow? Well, we accept that it's bitter. We accept that it's not pleasant. We accept it. Now, once you finally flip that switch, once you finally accept this happened, it was horrible, now you can swallow and get down to the breakdown. And here again, when it gets to negative experience, you're going to run into a lot of resistance. You're not going to want to break it down. It might give you the mental equivalent of indigestion. It might be really upsetting. It might upset your mental stomach. Sometimes you'll even regurgitate it back up into your mouth. You'll reject it again and throw it back up into feeling, oh, it's horrible, this is gross, I hate this, this sucks, right? It's back in your mouth again. You have to choose once again to swallow, accept, accept that this experience happened and that you can't get rid of it until you process it. That is the entire purpose of the mental digestion mechanism, to intake reality, to process it, and only once that's been done can it be released. So let's swallow down again. Let's bring it back down into the stomach, whatever this bad experience is. Now we're at the breakdown stage, stage two. And just like food in a stomach, the breakdown stage is all about separating out the elements, looking at all the facts, figuring out what happened from my perspective, from that person's perspective, what does it mean to me? All of the factors at play are separated out. In other words, this is where understanding happens. And of course, when you have to help this process along with manual attention, you just have to ask yourself a bunch of questions. And again, people can get stuck here forever. And a lot of times it's because they're not breaking down a piece of it that really needs to be broken down. There's some kind of uncomfortable chunk, difficult to digest stuff inside that experience. And a lot of time, ego is what's in your way here again. Now, once you've manually broken all of this down, it should naturally flow into the intestinal part of the process. Stage three, absorb and excrete, where it's very important to learn what you can from the situation. What you'll be absorbing from any situation you swallow in life is enlightenment, is truth, is lessons to move forward with. Find these elements and drop the junk Forget all of the details about egos intermingling, about who wronged that person. Forget it. That's shit. Literally, you're going to shit it out. All that matters is that you can find some lesson, some truth, some enlightenment in that situation. So moving forward in life, you can behave more intelligently, more maturely, in a more healthy way. And maybe by doing that, in the future, you'll avoid such an uncomfortable situation. You have learned, you have grown, the experience is not a waste. The experience was a lesson, even if it was horrible. Look, I went through some torturous stuff in my life, and through this process, I've managed to look back on it with positivity. It taught me something. What did it teach me? How have I grown? If you could find that silver lining, even the most horrible experience can be released as, well, this was a lesson for the soul. Um, you know, there's just so much you can learn when you actually break things down and allow the lessons to seep in. So that's it. Digestive system, the perfect analogy for what's going on inside your mind when it comes to digesting experience. We say it. We even say it. Digesting experience. It's right there. It really is like a digestive system. So, fellow human, that was a pile of information, wasn't it? And it may seem uh, maybe too... Um, analogous, it might seem too much of an analogy, it might seem too poetic or something like that, but that's how the mind works. And if you arm yourself with these ideas, I promise they really help you to map out what's happening inside of you and really help you to figure out how to move things through. And the rest is up to you. It's all about honestly facing yourself, honestly looking at your issues, and of course, as I said, most importantly, keeping the responsibility in yourself and not accepting outsourcing it. Other people can help through conversations and hashing things out, but never ever accept the idea that someone else needs to do something before you can heal. 
It'll send you on all sorts of tangents that really don't even help. You'll end up right where you were when you get back to you again. So good luck on your journey, fellow human. You're already off to a good start. The things I've shared with you are healing. And as far as I'm concerned, this episode is medicine. So please, share it with someone you know that's healing right now, whether it be from some kind of traumatic experience in life uh, on the emotional side, like a breakup or, or some kind of really devastating experience, or somebody who's facing a physical health challenge. Because let me tell you, after working with this for a while, I'm convinced that healing the mind does literally heal the body. And having a mind full of injury not only hinders physical health, but can get in the way of physical healing. But the good news is, fellow human, that just like life, healing wants to happen all the time. And on the most basic level, you'll find that all you have to do is get the hell out of the way. So, until next time, fellow human, you can find me on YouTube, you can find me on Twitter, you can find me on Facebook. All of the links are at higherideas.net. Please let me know if you found this helpful, let me know if you agree or disagree, or if you've got any questions, if there's any part of this I didn't explain well enough, please let me know and I'll make a follow-up. And if there are any subjects you'd like to hear my thoughts on, definitely send me an email, i at higherideas.net. And who knows, maybe it'll become an episode. So, until next time, fellow human, good luck with your healing, and above all, keep thinking.